Hey everybody, I'm Will Hall. Uh, thanks for joining me at the Law and Mental Health Conference. I'm going to be speaking with you about psychosis, disability justice, and uh, the abolition of forced psychiatric treatment. Um, so I want to thank Jason Renault and all the organizers of the conference. And so my website is willhall.net. Uh, you're welcome to contact with me with any questions, uh, any follow-up, especially if you're interested in some of the research base um, that is uh, supporting an alternative approach, the research that supports psychiatric um, forced treatment abolition and a new understanding of uh, psychosis. There's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of research out there that we don't often hear about, and I'm happy to uh, connect you with that. So um, I um, am a therapist. I do a lot of work with people um, who have a, a diagnosis of psychosis, schizophrenia, bipolar especially. Um, I do a lot of work with families. I'm trained in an approach called open dialogue. And uh, I am also uh, do a lot of training work and um, teaching work uh, around the world, um, as well as being a researcher uh, myself. I'm a PhD candidate at Maastricht University in the Netherlands in the School for Mental Health and Neuroscience. And all this started when I got drafted into the mental health system. I, I was... Um, uh, working as an environmental activist. I was in uh, uh, the nonprofit sector. I was sort of developing a career as an environmentalist. Uh, I lost all that because of an emotional crisis that I, that I went through. And then I really spiraled down over months, just down, 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 more and more stressors, more and more kind of toxic ingredients into my mental distress, isolation, uh, poverty. I wasn't eating well. I was um, was not sleeping well. There was cannabis involved. Family conflicts. I was very isolated. I wasn't talking to anybody. And uh, that's when I went into this, the psychiatric system. And so, what I encountered in uh, psychiatry um, was normalized violence. What I encountered was a, a systemic oppression and a systemic traumatizing of patients. And I know that it's really hard for a lot of us to recognize how extreme the situation is with psychiatry in terms of inflicting so much harm on so many people. But we really have a precedent. Uh, we have a history of psychiatry that shows us that it's happened before. And we should remember that prior to 1980, uh, being gay, was considered a mental disease. It was considered a mental disorder. And because it was seen as a disease and a disorder, it was um, uh, treated in very violent ways in the justification for um, addressing that disease or that disorder. Once, once people were seen as different, they were pathologized, their different experiences around sexual orientation, their minority experiences around sexual orientation were, were seen as a disease, as a pathology. It opened the door to brutal, violent, dehumanizing treatment. And let's remember that because that's the situation that we're in with the mental health system now. There is a whole set of assumptions, false assumptions that we have about psychosis and all the different mental health diagnoses just in the same way that there were a set of false assumptions that were in place around the treatment of homosexuality as a disease that harms so many people. We don't, we don't know. There's, there's um, not a kind of an incentive. There's, there's not really a big push for psychiatry to kind of come to terms with all the people that were harmed. But we're talking in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, many more people who were essentially assaulted, abducted, confined, uh, tortured, and some of them killed in asylums, in hospitals, all in the name of treating their mental disorder of being gay. And that is the situation that we have with psychiatry around psychosis today. And that is the, the system that I encountered and that is still in place uh, more than 20 years uh, later, I've been through a whole process 
of, of recovery, I went from uh, not knowing anything about the mental health system to when I was in it, really believing in it and really wanting help and really wanting to try the different medications and go to the groups and follow what the therapists and the doctors were telling me to leaving the system and then connecting with the psychiatric survivor movement, connecting with the peer self-help movement, and then finally finding a way slowly over many years, I was on a disability check for 15 years, finding a way to get my life back together. And this, I think, is one of the first kind of lessons that I want everyone to, to know is that just like we see someone who is homeless, we see them going through a period of their life. We see a snapshot of the larger movie. Or if we see someone who is trapped in a domestic violence situation, we see that as a moment in time. We see that as a process, a snapshot of a larger process in their life, the larger movie of their life. We have to see what we call psychosis as also a snapshot. There's a before, there's an after, there's a whole story. There's a whole range of possibilities. There's a lead a lead in, there's a build up, there's a context, there are situations, there's um, responses, there's reaction, there's forces at play that put people into that situation where circumstantially they end up being homeless, push people into that situation where they circumstantially end up staying with an abuser, an abuser Mostly it's a boyfriend or, or a husband, but all kinds of different scenarios. But they stay with that abusive partner. And in just the same way, there are all kinds of circumstances and forces that lead, person in, lead someone into that situation of psychosis. We should think of psychosis as a situation, not a trait. And yes, this absolutely flies in the face of the established psychiatric understandings and scientific ideology of our era, but again, that's what was going on with the way in which um, the experience of being gay was pathologized. The entire scientific research um, system was ideologically committed to homophobia. And that's essentially what we have now. We have a research system, we have a scientific understanding that is ideological, that's committed to seeing what gets called psychosis in the wrong way. And once we see it in the wrong way, we start to treat people differently because they're not quite like us and therefore they don't deserve the same kind of human rights, respect, regard, caring that the rest of us do. We get a us and them, a second class citizenship. So, and then all the, all the violence and all the abuses follow from that. So um, that's the system that I encountered when I went in to the mental health um, psychiatric hospitals, I was, um, it was my mid twenties. Um, I went to the, my, the Mount Zion Crisis Center on Divisadero Street in San Francisco. I don't think it's still there. I was at San Francisco General Hospital. Um, I was um, locked up for two months at UCSF um, Medical Center at Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. That's considered like top of the line psychiatric treatment. And I definitely know people, and I know that it's, it's a, a reality for a lot of people that they do find sanctuary in hospitals. They do have a good experience. Some people find that their medications are helpful to them. I absolutely honor and respect uh, diversity. I have a harm reduction approach. approach. I'm not pro-medications. I'm not anti-medications. I am supportive of where people at and what their experience is. The reality is that many, many people have the experience that I have that hospitalizations, medications, diagnosis were abusive. My experience was absolutely assault, kidnapping, confinement, and torture. And this is the reason that we're in a moral emergency because we've normalized this in society. And so there's a lot that I can say about um, my experience um, and my story, but keep in mind that at that time in my life, you would not have recognized me from where I am now. I was not able to, to talk <laughs> much to other people, much less to talk in groups or to give a, a workshop or do a training or be on a video or something like this. I was very, very withdrawn. I was absolutely terrified 
And I think that the, the term psychosis maybe just needs to be replaced by extreme fear because that's the experience that people have. They're, they're so afraid that they don't know why they're afraid. They can't even face the fact that they're afraid. They're just running away from that experience of absolute uh, terror. And I was um, absolutely terrified when I went into the psychiatric system. I was, I was deeply, de- deeply frightened. And my experience was um, that who I was then is very different than who I am now. You would not have recognized me from them. But again, it's a snapshot. It's not that somehow the disease has, you know, like been been healed or, or the, had been successfully treated, like the microbe inside the germ has been eliminated by the antibiotics. It's no, there was a learning process. You know, someone who's able to make it out of homelessness and move on in their life, there's maybe a learning process Maybe the circumstances change as well, but there's often a learning process, also someone who's a survivor of domestic violence. So I very strongly in the belief that we need to see people as going through situations of extreme stress and emotional distress and respond to the situations as snapshots in a transition out of those situations. Because, I mean, we could we could diagnose people who are so-called chronically homeless. We could say you have... You know, chronic domicile deficiency disorder. There actually was a, a, a push by psychiatry to create something called masochistic personality disorder. And guess what? That would be mostly diagnosed on women. And guess what? It would be mostly diagnosed on women who often stayed in abusive relationships. And yes, it's very difficult as a domestic violence worker. I've worked with lots of domestic violence workers and um worked with a lot of intimate partner violence um, agencies. And uh, it's very difficult to see people going back to their relationship or going back or reconciling with the abuser and then the cycle continues. You could very easily say, well, this is this person has a mental disorder, this person has a broken brain. No, there's reasons why the person goes back. There's a story there. There's a whole history there. And there's a learning process and there may be a trauma, there may be a trauma recovery process involved with that person being able to move on. But we absolutely know that they can move on. Everybody that we encounter who is homeless, we say this person could come out of it. That's the, the basic basic assumption in any kind of homeless uh, response, any kind of homeless service, is that the person can get out, of, get out of it. That's why we're giving them services. That's why it's also a basic fundamental assumption in, in intimate partner violence services that the person can get out of it they can change their life they can they can create safety for themselves when someone is gay and they're experiencing distress they're experiencing some kind of uh, obstacle some kind of oppression we make the assumption that yeah they can improve their life let's see what kind of empowerment they can gain maybe there's larger social forces maybe they're in a family or they're in a society that doesn't care and is homophobic and, and oppresses them, but we make the assumption that change is possible. This is exactly the attitude that we have to have around psychosis, but when that diagnosis comes in, as soon as we say you're different than us, you have a disorder, we stop seeing the person as a snapshot in time and we start seeing it as a trait, a genetic trait, a part of their character, something they can't really change. And then all the, the options that they're presented with just go away. We don't feel like we need to give them options. So if you had seen me back then, you would not recognize me. It would be very easy to just say, okay, this is a very disturbed young man. He has a history of, of mental illness in his family. Um, he, uh, you know, he has a genetic, a genetic predisposition. Um, he clearly needs to... Um, be on medications for the rest of his life to manage his symptoms. He needs to get out of his high stress environmental career, nonprofit job, and he needs to kind of lower his expectations and, and, um, and just come to terms with the fact that he's got a chronic mental illness. He has a thought disorder. And uh, this is exactly what was told to me. Um, they sat me down and they said, Mr. Hall, we've done all these, uh, tests on you because I was at a top flight, you know, university um, medical center psychiatric unit. 
and I had all the, the state-of-the-art treatments and testing available to, to me. Mr. Hall, you have a psychiatric disorder. Um, you have a thought disorder. You have a kind of schizophrenia called schizoaffective disorder. There's no cure, and the best you can do is... Now, really what was happening in that moment is that there was a choice being made to instead of seeing my situation as a snapshot in time, to see it as a trait. And it the most dangerous and the most pernicious of all is that when we saw, when psychiatry saw being gay as a pathology, people believed it. They internalized it. The internalized homophobia, the internalized oppression is often the worst kind of oppression. That is exactly the same with what happened to me and what happens to people with this psychosis diagnosis is that I internalize that belief. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The family starts to internalize it. The family starts, the expectations get lowered. Now think about that. If you, uh, we understand the power of expectations, every um, good quality manager or boss at a job knows that if their new employee comes in and they just say, oh, you did this wrong, and you did this wrong, and you did this wrong, and oh, you better not screw up again, what's the response of the employee? It's going to be a lot harder for them to do a good job because the expectation has already been, but a good manager, a good boss will say, you know, well, yeah, you made some mistakes, but I know it takes some time. Keep at it. I'm sure you'll do a good job next time. I'll sure, I'm sure you'll be able to, to change. You'll get the hang of it. Just keep at it. That attitude of expectation can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I was absolutely in extreme state of distress. Um, I was hearing aggressive voices. I thought that the devil was speaking to me through a postcard. I would leave out the window of my apartment. I had an experience where I was on the back balcony of uh, the apartment where I was living, and I would look out and I would see all these people in the windows, on the other balconies, up on the roof, staring at me. But as soon as I looked at them, they would all um, drop down and hide. And I would see um, mice or rats out of the corner of my my eyes. I mean, I was I was very distressed. Um, I was in a really um, very very difficult state, and I was told by my psychiatrist to go by my therapist to go for a medication adjustment. Um, and I went into a crisis clinic and they, I came in for the appointment. They locked the door behind me and they didn't let me go. They, I wanted, I was able to make a, um, uh, an agreement. I, I didn't want to kill myself. I wanted to go back to work. And they said, no, Mr. Hall, we're, we're hospitalizing you. And um, they put me in restraints. Uh, I was totally withdrawn. I was not angry. I was not arguing with them. I was not raising my voice. I was very, very much like this. And they put me in restraints. They strapped me into a, a wheelchair and put me on the back of a van um, because that's how, that's what they, what they said was that's how they transport everyone to the hospital. So I went to San Francisco General Hospital um, Emergency Services, Psych Services. I was so sensitive and so vulnerable and so terrified I cannot imagine a worse place to put me. Uh, I, I, it was surrounded by police came in. They would bring in people who were having drug reactions. Their fights broke out. It was crowded. They were terrifying, um, terrifying experience for me, really scary people. And so I was in this shock of essentially I had been kidnapped and I was held against my will. My experience was essentially assault, uh, kidnapping, and then confinement. I spent a year in the public system. I uh, was in um, solitary confinement. I was two months in forced treatment. So when I came out of the hospital, um, which was because the insurance ran out, I went from being gravely disabled and too psychotic to take care of myself to kicked out into a homeless shelter on 14th and Mission in San Francisco because the insurance ran out. Um, and when I came out, I started to try and make sense. I exhausted um, the medications and the treatments. I, I wasn't getting better. I was worse than when I, when I went in. And again, it's a snapshot in time. So there's a process. It's like a learning process. And it took me years. I was on disability for 15 years. But I slowly started to realize my way through 
all of this, which was not to continue to take medication. I connected with the psychiatric survivor movement. I built and created community around myself. And that's what made the difference for me. That, those were the ingredients that got me from there um, to here. And the, um, the main message that I had gotten when I was in the hospital wasn't, um, oh, you have this terrible experience. Um, it's so horrible, all this violence that happened to you. You must be really hurt and shocked and, and shaken up. Let's talk about it. Let's figure out how to make sense of all this. All that was normalized. They, they never asked me about what my experience was of being in this very pro provoking circumstance of being uh, abducted and held against my will and having my, losing my, my community, losing my, my job, losing my apartment, like my whole life crashed and burned because of this hospitalization. None of that was ever discussed. Um, it was normalized, and it was normalized for a lot of different reasons, the psychosis diagnosis, but also the um, suicide assessment that I had talked about being suicidal. And since then, I came out of the system and I was making sense of my experience. I came across research that the U.S. Army did where they looked at the entire field of suicidology, all the sociology, all the psychology, all the statistics, and they determined that there's no way to predict. You cannot predict whether one person will kill themselves or not. Um, and actually, the psychiatric profession is very keen to emphasize this because they don't want to be held liable when someone does, um, does kill themselves. Um, that you can do assessments, you can talk about statistics. Yes, men are more likely to complete suicides. Yes, men over the age of 50. Yes, if you have a history of suicide in your family. Yes, if you have um, unemployment. Yes, if you have means available. Yes, if you can describe a, a plan, um, recent grieving. I mean, all these different factors. But th those are factors in statistics. The actual assessment itself cannot determine so basically forcing me into the hospital, forcing other people into the hospital, isn't about protecting. Who are they protecting me from? They weren't protecting me from myself. They couldn't predict that I would end up killing myself. They were, certainly weren't protecting me from violence or harm because all this protection, all this violence and harm happened to me in the psychiatric system. Who are they protecting? The standard of care, the professional practice, the liability the problems with the insurance companies, the problems with the superiors in the hospital, the standard of care and the fear of professionals is driving those forced treatments um, around suicide risk. So the other rationale for forced treatment was, of course, psychosis itself. Now, let's take a step back because as I want everyone to understand that psychosis is a snapshot in time. There's a larger story. For me, there was a huge buildup. There were years of buildup, isolation, poverty, habits around food, habits around um, sleep, um, disconnection with other people, disconnection from my feelings, avoiding all kinds of life problems and challenges and overwhelming shame. There was a huge buildup. So just as I want everybody to understand psychosis as a snapshot in time, I also want you to understand psychosis is about an experience that anyone can have. The reality is that anyone listening to this talk right now, um, you also can hear voices. You also can go into a psychotic state. It's actually very simple. It's modeled um, with animals. I don't endorse animal testing, but there's a, a whole um, modeling of psychosis in laboratory animals. Stress, you just create stress. The main st stress, that, the way that you can introduce stress to a laboratory animal to model psychosis is well, you can introduce a drug. If you, um, if you introduce amphetamine, for example, animals will go into a psychotic-like response. You can also do sleep, sleep deprivation. If you introduce sleep deprivation um, to the animal, they will go into a psychotic-like response. Also, um, maternal neglect, if you take a rat um, which is a, a mammal, and you neglect it from its maternal connection at an early enough um, stage in its development, it'll start to exhibit psychotic symptoms. So anyone listening to this um, talk, you also can have psychotic symptoms 
given enough stress. And in fact, I bet you've probably already experienced some kind of psychotic symptom. So many of us, we all have cell phones now. How many of us have like, oh, wait, I just felt my phone vibrate or I just heard it ring in the other room and you go there and there wasn't. That's a hallucination. That actually when people are grieving, when um, people are isolated, when you're sleep deprived, your mind starts to play tricks on you. You're, you start to, these are reactions to stress. They're, so one of the key things I want you to come out of this with is the understanding that psychosis is a human characteristic. It's something, it's a capacity that we all have as a response to circumstance, to stressful circumstance. So now we're starting to back up from the idea of these are, those people over there, and we're starting to look at the story, we're starting to look at the context. The third thing that's really crucial to understand is there are ways to reach people. You can reach people. If someone is in a far out state, if you give them time, if you give them the basic safety that they need, if you don't toss them into an extremely traumatizing hospital situation, but if you take the time to build a relationship, then that person can um, reduce the stress, reduce the urgency, reduce the trauma response, and they can potentially start to work through some of their um, distress and then find a way back into this reality. It often takes a certain amount of skill um, to be able to build those bridges. You have to not be afraid. And the people who have the most talent in building the bridges to a psychotic experience are often the people who've been through the psychotic experience. Now, I wanna take a little step back here, and there are situations where someone might go into a psychosis from like a drug reaction or from a, 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 you know, a, a situation that they're in that if you just deal with that medication, then it'll remove the psychosis. And there also are, or a food reaction, allergy reaction, or an environmental toxin reaction. Um, there also are um, definitely uh, many people that um, throughout history will go into some of these mysterious psychotic states and then we, we, for some reason, we just can't reach them. Even the most resourced, the most innovative, the most um, humane. So there's a, there's a real mystery at the heart of psychosis. It's one of the reasons that madness is so terrifying is because it's overwhelming and it's, each person is different. And you know, even the, the best kind of clinical response, the best kind of resources, some people we just don't seem to reach. But we need to try for everybody because it's possible for everybody. The Hearing Voices Movement, the Soteria House, Open Dialogue. Now, we can get into the details of those different approaches, the peer movement, we can get into the details. It's not complicated. Take the time to build connection. Take the time to put resources in place just to have a sanctuary, just to have a place to go that's not a hospital. And yes, if it takes people visiting, if it takes counselors coming and doing support work with the family um, many times a week, that's what the Open Dialogue project, um, the, the open dialogue approach in Finland does. If it takes resources at the crisis stage, we're going to save those resources long term. So this is where the abolition piece and the disability rights, the disability justice piece comes in. Because if we can honestly look at the research and we can say, look, we don't have brain scans, we don't have genetic profiling, we don't have um, MRIs, we don't have blood tests that can d differentiate the psychotic brain from the so-called normal brain. We can differenti differentiate stress, we can differentiate a lot of things, but in terms of putting someone as a bo in a box of the schizophrenics, the bipolar, there really is no physiological basis that we've uh, determined. Medications work because they're sedating and tranquilizing and that can be very useful to people. But if we step back from the, these are the broken people, these are the different people framework of biological psychiatry, and then we say these are humans like all of us, and they're going through some experience that any of us could go through given the right circumstances. 
If we start to see people as a snapshot in time and we get curious about the buildup and maybe how next time we can prevent that buildup, then the absolute imperative becomes clear that all the violence that we're doing, the confinement, the um, forced drugging, the, the restraints, the seclusion room, none of that is necessary if we rebuild society along different lines. And I use that phrase, rebuild society, intentionally. That's what we're doing in disability. We have elevators, we have ramps, we have assistive communication devices, we have sign language interpreters, we have an awareness of how do you build the bridges to our people with disabilities because the social model of disability says it's not the person that's the problem, it's the lack of bridges, it's the society disabled people. Uh, the Hearing Voices Movement has done incredible research around the, the phenomenon of voice hearing. Most, most of the people who hear voices are not clinically diagnosed with anything because they live just fine with those voices. What is it that makes the difference of hearing voices um, for one person be distressing and the difference of hearing voices for another person not be distressing? Well, let's go back to the example of homosexuality. Some people in the 50s, they lived in environments, there were um, enclaves, ghettos, countercultures, where being gay was more accepted, more supported, the underground, and they were able to thrive in those contexts. Other people didn't. They were isolated. They were disconnected. They didn't have that support. So the research that we need to do is how is it that a normal human variation of having wild ideas or manic states or you know, strange delusional beliefs or intense withdrawal states or hearing voices, how is it that the response that goes to that contributes to the distress and and um, drives the distress. And again, it's not to say that everyone is like this, but um, there are some people who seem to be unreachable, but are or appear to be so far that we haven't been able to find. There's that mystery at the heart of, of madness. But the question then becomes, if we treat people as equals and the World Health Organization, the United Nations Convention on the Rights with People with Disabilities, the assumption of disability justice is people are equals, they should have equal rights under the law, then we must move to a voluntary, compassion-based mental health system because of the, the basic rights that everyone has to liberty and freedom. Now, yes, there's going to be harms and risks associated with liberty and freedom, but that's the nature of liberty and freedom. If we wanted to eliminate all, all harm in society, we would jail people for smoking cigarettes. We would, we would jail people for being ob obese because of the harm that comes from smoking cigarettes and um, being obese that would be intolerable if you, if you just throw out the freedom element of the equation. But people have equal rights, and so we have to find other ways to respond that respect their equal rights. That's the moral imperative that we have. As a professional, I invite you to connect with other professionals who share this perspective. And we're not gonna change the system overnight. I, I hope so, but I don't think it's likely to happen. Um, although maybe there's gonna be, they may, I mean, COVID was a really strange overnight experience, right? So I don't wanna rule out drastic positive change, but many of us do find that we're in these compromising, compromised situations. Present the dilemma. Take a stand for abolition and say, look, we don't have a soteria house or a peer respite. We don't have a, a, a group of trained peers to help build a bridge to this person. So that is why forced drugging and forced treatment are on the table. But that's not something that I endorse. That's not something I support. I'm working for a system where we do have those resources. We do have those bridges. We do have those ramps. We do have that, have that supported decision making. Um, and then we can start to really uh, prioritize what we need to prioritize, which is the fact that this is a moral emergency. Uh, we need to abolish um, forced psychiatric treatment. And to do that, we have to get the resources in, in place to reach and support people, especially at the early stages, not early drugging, but early response. We live in a society that is based on uncaring. 
Our society is based on materialism and individualism. Fundamentally, we're not going to be able to achieve any kind of real transformation of the psychiatric system without larger systemic change. Unless we have a caring-based society where people have the time to listen to each other, where there's the investment of resources in care, then we're not going to be able to solve uh, mental health uh, crisis, just like we're not going to be able to solve the homelessness crisis without systemic change in the way that our uh, real estate development system and our housing marketplace operates. I fundamentally think that a for-profit healthcare system will never meet the needs of people around their health because there's too much of an incentive, fiscal, financial incentive to market to chronic disease. And this is what's happening with pharma and it's what's happening with the insurance companies and the hospital industrial complex. These are customers. So um, please um, feel free to contact me. Get in touch with other professionals, the uh, International Society for the Psychological Study of Schizophrenia and Psychosis, ISPS, madinamerica.com. You can check out my website, Will, uh, Madness Radio. Go to my website, willhall.net, um, my podcast, Madness Radio, and um, my book, Outside Mental Health. This will get you connected um, with this broader world uh, where we do recognize that this is a moral emergency we're facing, and the solution is, is abolition. So thank you very much for this uh, talk. Feel free to get, um, get in touch with me. I appreciate your time. Take care.